One minute.
Okay. Uh, good morning to everybody and um, welcome to the best practice forum on um, IoT, big data and, and artificial intelligence. Um, I'm here with um, uh, Simon and uh, Wim Gisella. I'm a co-facilitator of the BPF together with uh, Simon and uh, Wim is uh, supporting the team from the Secretariat. I will uh, give the floor to Sumon that will explain a little bit about uh, the objective of the BPF. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Titi. And uh, thanks everyone for joining here. Thanks to our panelists. So I just uh, want to give a brief, brief in intro about the BPF actually, that how we started. And uh, we all know that uh, this free emerging technology is actually shaping our life, shaping our future. And, uh, and uh, there are some positive impacts of it. There may be some negative views of this technology as well. There are some challenges as well. So we, uh, we don't know yet what's going to happen, but uh, and, uh, this technology is evolving gradually. So we, we had a plan to, to start some basic guidelines so that we can follow some standard we can follow so that we do not end up in in a wrong direction so from that objective we started the bpf and uh, we have a, a mailing list where there's a vibrant discussion so we have a lot of meetings there and uh, eventually we have come up with a pre-igf document you can uh, find it into the website and uh, uh, based on that we like to start discussion today. We try to figure out some uh, some uh, best practices, best recommendation, and some uh, internet government pr perspective, what we should be doing. So detail in the document, and uh, probably panelists will be discussed in detail about that. I'll not go further here. I'll uh, give the mic to Wim to just say a little bit more about it. OK, thank you, um, Titi and Sumon. Um, and good morning all, I'm Wim de Huzelle. I'm working uh, with the IGF Secretariat and supporting the work of the Best Practice Forum on uh, IoT, Big Data and uh, Internet of uh, and, uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, it might be important to repeat again the uh, idea of the, uh, or the concept of a Best Practice Forum because Best Practice Forum is not a single um, meeting organized at an IGF, uh, like a workshop. No, the idea is that best practice forums start to work as soon as possible after an IGF meeting, uh, after they got the mandate from the uh, MAC advisory committee, and uh, try to collect uh, specialists, stakeholders, um, and discuss a specific policy topic. And in this case, it was um, uh, a discussion on the three uh, technologies. I think it, it was a little bit complex in the beginning how to combine, uh, but also it might be good for you to, to really, um, before the discussion, really focus, know that we are focusing on the um, place where those three technologies um, overlap, or not overlap, but combine each other, or are combined or um, used uh, collaboratively uh, on the internet. So that, that is the, really the focus of, uh, of this discussion uh, because there are a number of, uh, well, an endless number of applications uh, of, uh, of the tree that have nothing to do with the, uh, with the internet. So I would like to put that focus, uh, focus clear. Um, as Suman mentioned, uh, throughout the discussion, uh, the, BP, the discussions the BPF had identified a number of practices um, that are in our draft document put forward as, as ideas and that should but also be discussed here and hopefully uh, be further completed uh, and more we get more detailed uh, based on this discussion. Um, I'm not going to go through them in, in detail but um, some of them uh, or some of these, um, these best practices are for example be very clear on um, what you're talking about because there is it's very easy to to say internet of things artificial intelligence and then uh, nobody is actually uh, knowing what specific uh, 
part of this whole field you are talking about. So, uh, um, an other, uh, another point that was mentioned or another best practice that was discussed is try to be um, technology and time neutral if you um, discuss best practices because it's very easy to focus on one specific issue with one specific technology and try to fix that today. Call that a best practice and tomorrow um, this best practice or this guideline has become uh, relatively uh, useless. Uh, other points that were addressed in these best practices were or underlined the importance of collaboration, collaboration and with as many stakeholders as possible. Also think about ethics and human rights if you think about um, um, guidelines or guiding principles or best practices for these technologies. Um, and um, yeah, then the, the other important points are transparency and make sure that these um, principles are used to um, support and, and for example also to support small businesses, make sure that small businesses can uh, use uh, these technologies so that there becomes um, good competition between new, in, uh, new players and the, the old larger players. Um, this is just a rough overview of what we did. Uh, I think the rest of the, uh, the morning should be way more interesting <coughs> as we, I think, have a uh, very uh, interesting panel with different views. Uh, I would like just to repeat again, the Best Practice Forum has been working, has put out its draft report. The input uh, that comes from this meeting uh, will be incorporated in the document and the document will be published as an output of this, one of the outputs of the uh, IGF 2018 uh, soon after the meeting. So that means between now and definitely in the, between now and the end of the year. The idea is that this is not um, a nice document that has to be archived as what has happened at the IGF. No, the idea is that best practice forums work um, or give a kind of um, good overview, uh, produce outputs that can be used to inform um, policy debates that go uh, on at other places. So the idea is, and my question would be uh, for all of you, take what you hear today, take the uh, output document and uh, use that as a background information when you discuss um, best practices on these new technologies. I think it's time for me to uh, be silent and hand over to Alex who will uh, uh, introduce the uh, first part of the discussion and lead the first part of the discussion. Thank you. My name is Alex Kominos and I will be moderating today. So we have a quite a balanced panel with uh, stakeholders from multilateral uh, organizations, from governments, from civil society, academia and business. So we'll ask each panelist to speak for two and a half minutes to best practices and experiences within their sector or stakeholder environment. And we'll start with Nobu Nishigata from the OECD. Nobu, could you tell us about some best practices and experiences with regards to AI, big data, and IoT? Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Nobu Nishigata from the OECD and uh, before the coming to the OECD I was in the Japanese development and working on the development of the AI principles for the research and development and uh, for just you know the thing that I'm, I'm in the OECD, OECD is more like uh, evidence-based organization so I rather looking forward to hearing from you, including the floor, about the best practice so that the, we can build on the principles. I mean, actually, the OECD is now working on the development of the principles on the AI, which would foster trust and adoption at the same time. So actually, I can talk whole day to sh ex introduce the, the best practices that we found in our analysis, but it is not the way to do it today. So I, let me couple raise some points uh, I, we found as a challenges. Now the, then like, to me that the biggest challenge 
in, in, in this technology and artificial intelligence or like including IoT plus big data together. I'd say the biggest challenge is like uh, looking at the, the opportunities brought by the, this technology. Then we can expect more opportunities, but uh, at the, we found that some ethical or like a challenges to as a policymaker side. So in that sense, you know, the, the biggest challenge is gonna be like push the innovations or more opportunities. At the same time, we have to mitigate or the minimize the risks of the technologies. Like it, it is not only for AI. Like it, once, you know, we got the new technologies like biotech or other things, you know, we have to think these things. But so in that sense, in the implementation level at the each nation or community, then it's gonna be just in short way to say it's gonna be the risk management that in, for the technologies, but how we can manage the risk in the same way and then, then the whole globe. So like, this is the big question and then I noticed that OECD is the one who is developing the principles after the, the discussion at the G7 in 20, 2016, when we, when the Japan had the presidency of the G7 meeting, then the Minister of the Internet of Affairs and the Communication, the Sanae Takaichi at that time, uh, proposed to proceed a discussion on an AI in the international fora. And uh, then we said, so there are the, just let me say that, that, that there are many, many best practices in there already. And so then, then maybe it's gonna be the time to collective efforts gonna be the necessary for us to share the direction toward the, the better development of technology for our society. Thank you. Sorry, I want to go to Taylor Bentley from ICED and the Canadian government. Hi everybody, my name is Taylor Bentley. I am a policy advisor for the Internet Policy and Governance team at our economic ministry. It's called ICED, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada. So we started where most people did in this space with the Mirai botnet in 2016, uh, the largest DDoS uh, attack in history that leveraged insecure IoT devices that were used in the home and in businesses. So this was our main focus. Uh, what do we do? How do we respond? Uh, so consistent with Canada's best practice of taking a light-handed approach um, and really just trying to develop more of a, a framework to develop things rather than, you know, legislation on IoT, for instance. Um, we did work, we started partnering with, with other folks, and we uh, launched a process, uh, well, sorry, we joined a process that we were a founding partner in with Internet Society, CIRA, the .ca operator that has fantastic work on security issues, uh, CIPIC, which is a law clinic, technology law clinic at the University of Ottawa, and Canary, Canadian Research Network. So this process called the, launched by uh, ISOC North American Bureau specifically, the Canadian Multi-Stakeholder Process on Enhancing IoT Security. Uh, really uh, served as a, a forum for all Canadian expertise to be leveraged. Um, Canada has always, you know, acted or looked to act as a champion of the multi-stakeholder approach internationally for international internet governance. and. Domestically, it works um, for very practical reasons. You get the experts in the room together, right? Government does not uh, monopolize expertise in this space. In fact, we were learning quite a bit. The more uh, academics we engage, the more industry partners we engage. And then second of all, you get their buy-in because they're actually co-developing the approaches to this common problem with them, with us, with all of us together. Um, so this has been a really important initiative for us. It's ongoing. We're about eight months in, uh, planning on developing a year one report by February or March 2019, um, and then it'll likely continue on from there. Um, I'm happy to answer all kinds of questions. I've been talking about this quite a bit throughout the IGF, and really happy to be here on the panel today and to contribute to this best practice forum. Thank you very much. That was perfect on time. and. Uh, Next, we're speaking to Imane Bello, and Imane is a researcher and lecturer at Sciences Po in AI and human rights. Thank you for the introduction.
question, Alex. Um, I have only one point today, which is the need to advance literacy on AI. I wish that the term AI stops being used and that we, st we start being more pre precise on what exactly we mean when we talk about AI. If we want to achieve trust, which is this year, uh, this, which is the theme of this IGF, we need to nurture understanding um, and facilitate access to skills, knowledge, and inclusion. I'm not going to dwell on the demand for system transparency, especially when it comes um, from public actors that are clients of machine learning systems, or especially when uh, machine learning systems are used to um, have significant impact on people's life, whether or not uh, those uh, those decision-making processes are solely automated or not. Um, my questions to you is how do we collaborate in a multi-stakeholder approach? How do we collaborate in a way that is inclusive? And when do, when do we start and how do we start taking advantage of the challenges of machine learning systems? Let me give you an example. Um, data bias is an issue. We, I think we can all agree on that. But it's also a tool to detect discrimination. So what kind of partnerships do we build? Um, how do we enhance understanding and inclusion? Thank you. I'm happy to take any, quest any questions. OK, so we'll be taking questions uh, for the next, next round uh, after we've done with the next two speakers. And we have um, Peter Maisek representing civil society and he's General Policy Counsel for Access Now. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I think from our perspective as a human rights organization, uh, working at the intersection of, of human rights, emerging technologies, um, and vulnerable and marginalized populations, we do see more worse practice than best, um, especially when it comes to the Internet of Things and um, uh, the massive new um, tranches of personal data that these devices and sensors uh, create and collect. So um, we do see that more devices um, means that more sensitive personal data um, will be produced and collected. Uh, the devices themselves are often largely insecure, raising risk of, of breach and exploitation um, and leak of personal data. Um, we support initiatives like the governor of California just signed into law um, in an IoT bill in September um, that requires manufacturers to equip connected devices with a reasonable security feature or features. That's um, clearly broad language, but we think it's a good step. Um, and uh, though the law only applies to devices sold in California, of course, um, California is a leader in regulation, um, which uh, can reverberate globally. Uh, we also add that there are instances where the risk of harm uh, to cybersecurity um, and individual privacy of deploying IoT devices that was too high to justify their use in the first place. And uh, in situations where connected devices um, uh, should not be used include in uh, children's toys and, and gadgets and um, devices that send tech aimed at young people as well as in, in many medical devices and situations. Um, moving to the AI questions, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, movement on ethics and AI and fairness. Um, however, we've seen scant attention to human rights. Um, partly this is due to the fact that the human rights community has only begun, recently begun to consider the full range of risks of AI and there's considerable uncertainty about how to conceptualize these risks. Um, however, again, we have seen worse practices. A new machine-enabled enforcement of YouTube community guidelines led to the removal and deletion of hundreds of thousands of videos um, and entire channels documenting atrocities in Syria. Um, this is crucial human rights um, uh, documentation uh, that many of, in many cases was lost forever um, due to this new implementation. Um, and it has led to um, a lot of multi-stakeholder efforts um, to try to retrieve and, and repair the damage, um, but damage has been done. Um, we have therefore um, put out a new uh, paper building on um, the uh, learning so far and showing how human rights um, can complement existing ethics efforts. Um, human rights does provide um, uh, 
common framework and agreed upon forums um, that provide access to well-defined remedies, um, all of which we believe are a more concrete foundation uh, to move forward um, urgently um, to address the risks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And now offering a perspective from the private sector is Dr. Mike Nelson, uh, tech strategy of, from Cloudflare. Uh, thank you very much. Um, since we have such little time, and since my job is to be provocative, I'm going to try to speak in tweets. I, I recently spoke at a UN conference and I gave five tweets about the Internet of Things, five myths about the Internet of Things, which I summarized in five tweets, and then six myths about artificial intelligence. So look for the hashtag six myths, five myths, where the number is spelled out. Let me give you just three, four really important ones. First off, uh, I really think it's important that we realize that we need to look at the whole system. This paper is special because we're looking at the combination of AI, big data, and the Internet of Things. Solving a lot of the problems with the Internet of Things is not going to happen if we just focus on the things. We need to look at the network, the gateways that connect the things, and the artificial program, uh, intelligence programs, the machine learning programs that can be embedded in the cloud that will control the things. Second point, big myth. This isn't about a few big companies. These opportunities with these technologies are something even the smallest companies will be able to use as we build out platforms like Amazon, Lambda, Cloudflare workers. These are technologies that allow the entire network to serve as a computer and to control the devices, to process the information as a system. Third point is already made very eloquently. Stop using the term artificial intelligence. It's older than I am. There are 15 different definitions and they're all confused. What we focused on in our report and what I think the internet community is focused on is big data related to machine learning. And that's really where the, the interesting applications are for the internet. And then the last point is we can standardize and solve this problem. There are so many different types of things, so many different types of applications. There's not going to be one way to make everything work, certainly not globally. So let's think of many different approaches to making this system more secure, making it more accessible to more types of businesses and institutions and governments. So I, I, I just want to focus on, on those three myths and urge you to read the report, even if you only have 10 minutes, scan it, see if there's something in there that you want to reinforce or see if there's something in there that you really want to reject. And I look forward to your comments because we're not supposed to be panelists, we're supposed to be discussion catalysts. And thank you for catalyzing that discussion. I think a common thread seems to be the need to unpack the terms and to ha perhaps be critical of the terms. I think there was a question whether the IoT, big data, Internet of Things is too broad a topic, but I think what it points to is an ecosystem that, that suddenly brings issues to the fore and, and makes AI more meaningful, makes the big data more meaningful and makes the Internet of Things more meaningful. The things collect the data and feeds the machine learning. So now I'd like to turn to the audience and the audience, we're going to get questions for the panelists as well as reflections on best practices. And I'll take three questions at a time, starting with the gentleman in the corner there. Thank you very much. What you said, the last speaker, what you said is very important. And I think that uh, the most important thing to solve is the, is the trust. At all levels, you will have Internet of Things. So we will have things stick to us. How shall we trust the sensors? How shall we trust the actuators? How shall we trust the applications to use them? Big data, the same. So 
all is about trust. And I think this is the first thing that we have to address. Could I collect a second question? There we uh, hello, I'm Veronika Stefan. I'm here on behalf of the Department of the Council of Europe, but then I also work with the think tank back in Romania. So I have two points here, and one is make sure that whenever you discuss about AI first, you don't say let's not use AI, but then the whole session is about AI, because indeed we are replacing the terminology digital with whatever it's a buzzword. Uh, it is important to make sure that all stakeholder groups are involved when we design the technology of the future. And I am highlighting here the youth as a sector and youth organizations to be part of the process. But I'm, I'm also highlighting the part that young entrepreneurs right now are a little bit forced whenever you debate about AI. To, to make sure they fit in the box, because everything that is innovation and it's funding for innovation, it has to be AI or blockchain or anything of the kind. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you all. Um, building off of the first comment, I, I agree and think that building trust with the public is going to be very important. And uh, I have a comment on the, the number six best practice proposed about uh, making privacy and transparency a policy goal and business practice. I think uh, that's good. I think extending that to uh, also emphasize trust more broadly um, and the need for that, that to be employed by uh, governments and other stakeholders as well uh, in addition to just businesses. I think having governments uh, take initiative in, in providing transparency is also going to be important. Thank you kindly. Uh, could we move on to who? Mike. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, two of you really emphasized trust because that was the one thing I didn't emphasize as much as I wanted to in my two and a half minutes. Transparency is key to that, but another key thing is competition and choice. People will trust systems more if they know they can leave one system and go to another. Uh, the, the, our, the machine learning tools that are de being developed are often being developed in the cloud, but you have to move your data into the cloud. One of the problems today is that's not always easy. Uh, look at what was just announced last month with the Bandwidth Alliance. A number of cloud services, including people providing machine learning services, have agreed that they're going to work together so users of these tools can move data back and forth between different tools and get the answer they need from the best tool that they can get. There might be a need to actually do, um, you know, to, to, to use two or three different tools. And we don't want everybody locked into one cloud service. The other thing I'd say is trust is so important that it probably is the thread that ties together this whole report. Several of these principles are things that are about increasing trust. So thank you very much for, for touching on that. Yes, thank you. I uh, appreciate that point as well. It's nice that it is the first point popping up after the introductions. Uh, I'm on board with uh, what, what Mike said about also the make the cloud work, etc. Uh, yet I would like to take the cloud a little bit further and include people in that. Uh, both the people that use it and the organizations that secure it, that, that, that offer that. So if uh, the people that use it are informed and there, uh, the, what the gentleman uh, took out of uh, point six, make privacy and, and, and transparency, that helps people to use it and to understand it. And uh, uh, if organizations that secure it take their responsibility uh, and not dump that all on the users, but uh, put that in, then I think we can create that world of trust. And because speed of change of tech innovation is so fast, let's not wait for people to fully understand it, but let's make sure we take it into account from the outset. Okay, sure, Taylor. Thanks, so all great points and I plus one to all of them. Um, so mistrust is a toxic emotion, but it's also a very human emotion and it comes from places of ignorance. And I was really sad to hear, um, or you know, I was a little bit, I guess, sympathetic. Um, a national IGF coming up has a session called, Is Technology Moving Too Fast? 
And um, that is understandable because it does feel fast. Um, but they were talking specifically about security issues that the IETF has been working on for 20 years. But it's difficult sometimes to, to understand and to see what's going on. This is a very complicated uh, ecosystem and community. And so how you fix trust is not necessarily transparency uh, or not, I would say, uh, limited to transparency, but it's conversation, it's dialogue, it's coming to the table, uh, being very open-ended. I've been very happy to see the response from my Government of Canada colleagues, including from security and intelligence departments who come very, um, you know, candidly to these kinds types of conversations. So I think the more we talk to each other and understand each other and empathize with each other, the more trust that we'll engender. Thank you. Okay, before we move back to the audience, we're going to move to a very important stakeholder group, and those are the people that come from the internet. We have a remote question. This question is from Ami Sinou. Uh, what is the key issue for the AI, big data, and IoT in Africa area where the infra infrastructure challenges for data center are not getting solution from businesses? We have another remote question. Uh, yes, and the same person, AI, call algorithm technology knowledge, where is the best university who study these technologies from f francophone people in Africa? Okay, we'll move to, uh, two panelists can answer the question and then back to the audience. So as I understand the first question, what, what are the unique challenges um, to uh, the African community uh, when it comes to these main issues? Now I'll focus specifically on IoT, but I think it's applicable to all of them, that they are the same issues. Uh, we're all people who want to feel uh, comfortable and enabled and empowered by our technology, uh, but we're all facing the same challenges. And I know in Canada, uh, rural connectivity is a, is a strong challenge that is omnipresent and continuing, and there are quite a few IoT-enabled solutions, including um, community networks, mesh networks, to address these problems. And I think, uh, you know, the more that we can all work together across international, like across uh, international borders, the more that we can ensure that we're all part of the solution, because it's a mutual problem and a mutual solution is apt. Thank you. I'm going to move to Peter, but I'm going to step outside of my role as a moderator because I am from Africa, South Africa. So I would say we're returning in some sense. We, we have an era of ubiquitous computing. It's available on edge devices. It's available on the cloud. And uh, 60 years ago when AI was new, you would have to go to a research institute and you'd take your punch cards there and you'd buy time on a mainframe. And that mainframe is the cloud offering its own privacy and human rights concerns and access concerns, but we have um, a number of cloud services to use and I think the challenges will be whether those cloud services are hosted and domiciled in Africa and some of the cloud providers are moving there. Amazon Web Services was conceptualized in Cape Town, but we're only getting data centers in 2020 uh, in, South, in South Africa, Azure is there. Uh, but yeah, one can also do computing on edge devices and, and um, there's immense computing power that's collective. So I think there's, there, there is a chance to, to kind of leapfrog certain developmental obstacles to h powerful computing. And we'll move over to Peter. Thanks. Um, just a, two points to add. I think uh, first, uh, I am concerned about um, electricity and, and water use uh, as these data centers are, are being increasingly built um, in places not perhaps best um, to host them. But more importantly, I think uh, that data protection is, is a key challenge um, across Africa and um, is, is perhaps more pressing um, than in some other regions. Um, Africa did just hold its first data protection summit um, in the last couple months, which is an excellent step uh, towards enforcing the Convention on Cybersecurity and Data Protection, which unfortunately has not been widely ratified and much less implemented into national legislation. Data protection laws and, and, and the exercise of basic data protection rights, along with privacy rights, are essential to 
um, addressing many of the risks that will arise uh, from the, the spread of new sensors and, and IoT tech um, and can help actually have a direct role um, in mitigating risk posed by um, machine learning and, and similar technologies. Mike. Just a real quick add. Uh, you ask about challenges, but some of these challenges are opportunities as well. The fact that the infrastructure is being built for the first time in some of these countries means that it will be built with leading edge technology, wireless. It's the fact that there's a huge investment going into infrastructure in Africa means that roads and bridges will have sensors built in and will be more efficient and, and be able to monitor them. And I think the most exciting thing is that because of the younger demographic in most African nations, you have a whole lot of people coming into the workforce, being trained about the latest technology, and even more important, they've got a young person's mindset willing to try new and crazy things that might just be game-changing. Yes, very short. Um, let's uh, put high attention on capacity building as well. Uh, the West or the industrialized world bringing uh, the technology to Africa is not good enough. Uh, it's really important that uh, there's people on the ground who understand the issues they're dealing with, who understand the technologies that are in use and able to match that. The, the, the price of technology is uh, big investments uh, may, may be needed, but small investments also can help. Uh, yet. For both, you need to be able to guide that. So capacity building is a major priority moving forward from here. Okay, we had a question here, a question here, and a third gentleman in the back. My name is Jutta from Germany, from the Digital Opportunities Foundation, acting as a MAC member for civil society, uh, and I'm working in the field of children's rights and child protection. I I would not like to overstress the risks over the benefits of a AI, IoT, and big data, but still I was really glad to hear Peter mentioning children as a vulnerable group in this area. And my, my question to the panelists is, uh, how far do you think we could come with implementing the principle of safety by design in all these developments, especially in Internet of Things, in order to build trust not only for the safety of children, but also trust for and safety for all of the users. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, one of the things that is always mentioned when it comes to emerging technologies is the exacerbation of divides across the board. And so one of the things that I'm actually interested to learn is when the technology decision making seems to be heteronormative, ableist, and culturally Western-centric. What are the efforts, the best practices to actually put on paper that this is an inclusive process and does in fact account for the different um, considerations? Thank you. Question at the back. Thank you, Chair. My name is Walter Natwis. I run my own consultancy. I've got some comments to make and a question. I think that at this point in time, it seems like the whole economy is changing from a money-based or organization, basically, to a data value organization. And if that is true, the data becomes more valuable than money, it's going to be a major game changer. And that means that this discussion we are having at this point in time, we have only one chance to do it right. Otherwise, we may miserably fail at several points. I just come from a session on IoT security and we had presentations from Canada, from the Netherlands, from the UK. And the question was, what can the IGF do? And two out of three said, let's not wait for the IGF and come back next year and see where we are. And here I am at this session focusing on IoT, big data, and third one, sorry, uh, on AI. Uh, why are these people not aware that this work is going on two rooms down down the lane from here. So there's a, a tremendous amount for reach out. So I, the IETF, the In Internet Engineering Task Force, is working on all sorts of solutions concerning the new internet and the new internet architecture. Why are they not here in the room? Why are they not on the panel? Because they've got several solutions 
for the questions we're addressing. Where is the major industry that's actually developing these, these tools? Yes, Mike, I know. Where, so much, where, where, where are the bigger represented? Where are consumer organizations? When I come to my final point is, this is such an extremely difficult and hard question to tackle for societies because we are many, with many societies here, many countries. So who can actually play a leading role in this discussion? Because I come back to my second comment, which is I think we're only going to get one chance to get this right. Okay, so we have themes along currency of data, safety, and bias, and also many competing norm setting agendas happening in Paris. I also want to know why we weren't, as a panel, invited to the Paris Peace Forum <laughs> or to sign the, the Paris Agreement. Um, who would like to tackle the question? Imane. Thank you. Um, on the questions about the best, the best practices related to uh, inclusive processes or, and or whether or not different considerations are taken into account um, when we talk about emerging technologies or machine learning systems and their impact and consequence on the exacerbation of the digital divide. I think that there are um, numerous uh, efforts that have been made from the technical community and from a civil society when it comes to data discrimination, for instance, and the need to advance transparency. So if we talk about data discrimination, you have two uh, main points that have been made. Then first, there is this work that is done on um, making sure that the historical training data sets of machine learning systems are as diverse as they can be as of now. And then, you know, um, there is also a monitoring work um, that is done on the outcomes of the applications uh, of the of the applications of machine learning systems. So you got, you have several uh, technical efforts that are underway, and then you also have the work of the civil society uh, making sure and monitoring um, those efforts. Okay, uh, Mike. I'm going to take issue with your comment about moving from a money-based economy to a data-based economy. I think we're moving to an insight-based economy. And that's why combining these three technologies is so important. This feeds into the earlier question about diversity and having as many views as possible. Your insights are going to be flawed if you're not looking at the whole picture. Cloudflare now has eight data centers in Africa. We'll soon have 15. That helps us understand how the internet is being used in Africa so that we can make it faster and more secure. We're also trying to hire as many people from in as many places as possible. And we'll hire about 100 people in the next two months, so please apply. Um, <laughs> this is really important, though, because we are going to end up with the wrong answers if all of our insights are based on data that only comes from a small subset of the internet users and the devices that are out there. So I, I love those two questions. And we can argue later over a beer about uh, how the economy is going. I would refer everybody to an amazing article that came out yesterday on Singularity Hub by Peter Diamandis. And it's on how the insurance industry, one of the largest industries and one of the most profitable industries in the world, will probably be completely undermined by the technologies we're talking about. Because if you can detect the risks before they happen, if you can prevent the accidents, suddenly there's n less need for insurance, or at least the premiums go down dramatically. Okay, I'll take Peter. <laughs> sorry. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to pick up on uh, one element of uh, Sue's question and Adam's question as well. So um, as far as how far can we get and who can play a leading role. I think a lot of it is the constitution of whomever the leader is. Um, so I do think government plays a very important role of conveying legitimacy of the, the process, of a multi-stakeholder process, of you know leveraging its own networks to ensure that it has a diversity of views, leverage own diversity within um, its government priorities. For instance, Canada's priorities on gender equity and um, gender-based analysis plus. 
And I think the, like how far can we get in implementing these secure by design? It really is the consensus of that group, um, a consensus of a, of a fully representative group of all positions that helps us try to find this elusive balance of security and innovation that we're striving for. And, and, and trust it always comes out of the, I think it's almost the, uh, the byproduct of that because we can trust that the process has been done with legitimacy, that it's been done with good faith, that it represents all of these views. Obviously that's exceptionally difficult. It requires a lot of cold calls uh, for myself. Uh, you know, some of them go unanswered, but you uh, do your you do your best, and it's as I say, it's just it's just not it's not an easy task, but it's one that we're all committed to. Thank you. That was just Taylor for the record. I switched the names in my head. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the audience. Unless someone from the BPF wants to a a address the the question about why we are not engaged well. Why other initiatives aren't on board? And, and I would say that the BPFs are available for anybody to get involved in. And perhaps this does point to an issue of IGF education and, and preparedness um, in terms of people are coming to the IGF, but many don't know all of the forums that are available to them and how to get involved. Thank you. I'm Claire Milne, I'm a consultant from the UK, but I work internationally. And I'd like to start by answering the question from the gentleman at the back. Uh, you asked where are the consumer organizations? Well, here's one representative of some consumer organizations and we only wish there were more. It's not that we're not concerned, but as I'm sure you all know, there are terrible funding shortages and people get diverted onto shorter term priorities. Uh, but actually there has been a publication from a consortium of consumer organizations specifically on IoT security. And if people don't know that and you want to hunt on um, Consumers International or Bayuk or ANEC, you will find it. Um, I'm among both its supporters and its detractors because I think it needs a lot more work, but I'm pleased that it's there for a good start. But what I actually wanted to say is, um, thank you, Emmanuel, for wanting to abolish the term AI. And I would like to go even further and say, I think we should abolish the term trust. And I'm sorry that it's actually in the title of this conference that we're all at, but I don't want to just abolish it. I'd like to replace it by trustworthiness, because we do not want blind trust. We need devices and systems and people who are worthy of that trust. And what is particularly important about the term trustworthiness is that it's very much more specific than trust. Now, if you think about your own lives, you do not tend to trust the same person to drive your car and to look after your children. Um, you trust, well, it may be uh, your spouse in both cases, uh, but um, I won't say it's impossible. But if you happen to be going to a wider circle, you may well look for two different people to do those two different things. And when we put AI, IoT, and big data into the same bucket, which we're doing in this forum here, I do agree we need to do that, but at the same time, we need to recognize that it gets to be an enormous bucket with so many applications in it. And so my question for the panel and for the room is what are actually our priorities specifically for trustworthiness? And we hear a great deal about security. Uh, we hear a lot, though maybe a little less, about privacy. We hear less again about the dangers inherent in cyber physicality. And I'm particularly interested myself if, um, I have a wonderful old washing machine now, but it is, I'm afraid, going to break down one of these years. And when I buy a new washing machine, am I going to have the option to buy one that doesn't have an intelligent chip in it? Um, if not, then, um, is my washing machine still going to work when the chip breaks down? 
Thank you. Claire, if I can just clarify. I agree, it sounds, the title makes it sound like we're covering everything. It's actually more focused. We're looking at applications that use Internet of Things, big data, and machine learning, artificial intelligence. So we're just looking at the overlap of those three technologies. So it's, it's, it's impossible, but it's not that impossible. Well, well, right, but there's still a lot in it, and I think we've agreed before that that overlap is getting bigger all the time. And what happened to robotics, by the way? Isn't that in there too? No, <laughs> it's not. That, that was kept off the table. Can we take the trust one quickly, and then I'm going to do a round of questions, because I think it was quite... Microsoft agrees with you. They, they talked about trustworthy computing about five years ago. Yeah, I think that's something that all stakeholders must uh, strive to um, to attain is the feeling and, and engendering trustworthiness. Um, just on your point about you know privacy and security, I think they're all it's the same way that AI, IoT, and, and big data are all overlapping. I think privacy and security are all overlapping. You can't have privacy if data is being translated unsecurely. Um, so we're definitely thinking about this. And also to the point about um, you know harm and, and physical security because thankfully we have not had an incident yet. Um, if we did, then there would be plenty of post-market mechanisms that governments such as Canada could use. Um, you know, Consumer Safety Act and uh, and a lot of you know like mis mis um, like mislabeling or deceptive practices that could be that could be leveraged, but. The key is now the urgency of doing as much as we can, as best we can, before that incident occurs. So thank you. Okay. Uh, I mean, a lot of design, or privacy by design, is working on the assumption that certain aspects of the internet or the IoT environment can't be trusted. So I'm going to take the gentleman in the pink and blue tie, um, in the gray sweater, and from the internet. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any, 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 any questions. I've got some small comments. I belong to the government of the Russian Federation, a Minister of Foreign Affairs. And, uh, let me just explain to you some, some w what's come to, to my mind. By the way, uh, there is very interesting discussion. And the, uh, the uh, question was raised by the uh, uh, well distinguished guest from, from, from back regarding the leading role of that. It is the extremely essential from our understanding. Why? We know, uh, we see that the world right now, just to some extent, is divided in null technologies and the uh, modern technologies, so-called emerging technologies. So, uh, uh, you've mentioned regarding artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, well, clouds, big data, but who should monitor, who should rule on that? Uh, on one hand, we do see that the world is changing uh, rapidly enough. On the other hand, that gives us more threats uh, on misuse of these uh, technologies. So, in this, in this case, the issue, uh, who would play the leading role on, on that? That is quite clear. The only UN system and their respective organizations could uh, uh, probably construct a new platform for that. And uh, by the way, just uh, yesterday's uh, resolution adopted by the um, third committee of the General Assembly on behalf of the Russia, China, BRICS countries, and many, many others, uh, with the name of countering of the use of information communication technologies for criminal purposes, precisely mentioning that we take note of the potential for emerging technologies, including, by the way, artificial intelligence in preventing and combating the use of information and communication technologies for criminal purposes. So the only, the only probably, the only one platform in the world uh, on which, based on which we can work. Regarding the second issue, regarding the education and universities, so certainly, uh, well, my, my, my pleasure to invite all the uh, interesting uh, well, students to come to Russia because it's a wonderful university. Unfortunately, we are not the French-speaking countries. Anyway, sometimes it is quite difficult to enter because of the high rate of education. Uh, the same can be said for probably UK, from USA. But uh, in order to understand what does it mean, the artificial intelligence, we have to start from the kindergarten, probably. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Korsin Boerman, I'm a software developer from the Netherlands, and I would like to continue for a bit on the trust issues. Back in the days when the internet was invented, it uh, 
brought a promise of decentralized wealth. And there's, uh, this idea I got from a book, uh, which I think was called the, the promise of the internet. Uh, but in the end, the power on the internet is centered around a few big companies like Facebook and Google. And I believe the technologies we are speaking about here right now have the power are a new revolution um, in internet technology. Another feeling I also have is that these big internet com companies um, value their short-term profits over the health of their users. And there have been a few ta uh, panels about that yesterday. Is the health of users and decentralization of these emerging technologies being considered by the panel uh, and are these being considered as best practices? This is a question from Olu Asun Adjani from Nigeria. How can we scale up low cost to IoT technology for effective health care delivery in developing countries? Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the questions, and I just want to frame it to say that we're running out of time a bit, and the last 20 minutes is about next steps and uh, moving forward. So definitely do answer the questions, but if there's any next steps or issues that you see open, you can also comment to that, and then we'll go to the audience. Mike. I'll just pick up the last point about healthcare. Um, a lot of the most exciting, pub well publicized application of the Internet of Things is coming from the healthcare arena. Um, we're, we're involved in one project. We're helping secure Fitbits so people can use them for uh, monitoring their athletic activities. And because they're using our service, that data is secured as it travels back to the Internet and back to the Fitbit servers that collect it and make it more useful to the user. But what's really exciting for the Internet of Things is often the most boring. That sounds strange, but some of the biggest changes are going to be in logistics and supply chain. It's, you know, Fitbit, people see that on people's wrists, but making sure that the supply chain of pharmaceuticals is secure. So each pill bottle has its own little sensor, and you can know whether it got too hot and the the medication is no longer effective. I mean, that's all really important, but it's almost invisible. Uh, there's, uh, this isn't true in general of the Internet of Things. It's, 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 the, it's the infrastructure stuff, this behind the scenes stuff that's going to make a lot of money and also going to change our lives whether we realize it or not. Uh, I actually had some comments. I, I hope someone takes on the, the question from our, 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 our colleague from Russia. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, two quick responses. And I just want to underline again, I find you very trustworthy um, for giving that intervention uh, that um, you know, these, these technologies are going to be being placed into systems with deep historical legacies of marginalization, exclusion, um, and uh, just to take one example, the U.S. criminal justice system, where we do see uh, machine learning technologies uh, employed in, in bond um, setting and in sentencing, um, that uh, you know the answer that that people from these communities should be expected to volunteer their personal data to help um, create more robust insights or um, better data sets is is laughable at best. Um, there's Basically, those, those of power have done nothing to deserve such trust um, historically. So that, that really is outreach that needs to happen. And I believe that, that it's, the onus is on companies and developers as well as governments. Companies um, can, as far as next steps, uh, develop and, and implement human rights due diligence based on strong and uh, robust and open human rights policies. 
Um, they can join uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives with true accountability mechanisms. Um, Global Network Initiative could expand to take on more of a role in this. Um, and ranking digital rights indicators, um, I believe, are, are going to develop further in this space. Um, it's another set uh, framework that companies can help follow. Um, as far as the governments, I was um, in the third committee um, hearings on, on a number of resolutions, um, including those referred to by Russia. However, I, I had to um, basically hide my affiliation because the word closed was on, on the TV sets outside of those committee hearings. And um, these, uh, these are not multi-stakeholder uh, debates taking place at the, uh, the third committee of the UN General Assembly. Um, and they certainly are not um, at the International Telecommunications Union. So these, these forums need to break open um, and really accept that more stakeholders need to be brought in and on an equal basis um, before they are trustworthy um, places to develop policy. Thank you. Exactly, so I was told to be short, so I just have a, one sentence, um, which is that there won't be any trustworthiness without inclusion and, tr and transparency. And as of education is concerned, it is not sufficient. It's only a first step. Super. Uh, Martin's going to wrap up, and maybe we'll take some questions if we have time. Well, let's try to make it even more dynamic than it already was. Uh, I'll stand here, and I have a roving mic. Uh, you have your own on your thingy. Uh, thanks for the question. I've, I've, I think multilateral continues to be very important to underpin whatever we do. Uh, but it's, it's also about how uh, I think it's recognized and widely recognized that uh, it's a multi-stakeholder approach that uh, we seek and no stakeholder can do it alone. In that spirit also uh, our document, our output document that you uh, have seen in advance of this uh, meeting has been developed. Uh, this best practice forum is to address the internet policy issues related in a collaborative bottom-up process. And uh, the output document is in to include an understanding of global good practice as said, combining how these technologies we talk about can benefit internet users and others around the world. And what is needed to ensure that these benefits don't come at the cost of, and I'm sorry, trust, I, I like the word, justify trust or trustworthiness uh, very much there. So the question here to you is, intent of this best practice forum is to move towards Berlin next year, to have an advanced document with a deeper understanding of what is needed to uh, combining those uh, technologies in such a way that it benefit internet users and they can justifiably trust it. Uh, you will have seen uh, that there is a couple of principles that uh, we've, we uh, proposed here. Uh, there was explicit reference made to number six, but there's actually eight principles. Um, we had some discussion in the group whether we would need a kind of overarching principle uh, like ethical considerations from the outset, knowing that we cannot determine where it goes, in order to create a free, secure, and enabling rights environment before these principles. Whether that's needed or not, we had a discussion about to ask uh, my, um, Mike to say a, a, a bit of uh, his thinking on, on that as well. Um, and after that, I'd like you to come back uh, on the principles that have been proposed. And if there's any you think don't deserve the attention, please let us know. If you think there's others missing, uh, please let us know as well. And if you have specific remarks about the direction that we should look further in developing over the coming year, uh, that is the input we're seeking for in this last uh, hour. Uh, sh should we frame that overarching principle thing first? Okay, so the first one is, do we need an overarching principle of ethical by outset? I, I only put, put uh, we, we discussed this beforehand, right? No, we, we said it on, on the online one. Okay, any... Uh, please, the lady in the white and then the lady in the Thank you very much. Um, I'm Alexandra Lutz. I'm an international law graduate and I'm also the president of an association called Climates, 
uh, Wakanda environment. And that's actually something I'd like to put forward. It's been already touched by uh, Peter Mishek today, but I would really like to emphasize it uh, for the step forwards and what I would love to see also in the future. So uh, it's actually about environmental impact and sustainability of those technologies because we know that they're going to grow exponentially in the future. And at the same time, we have uh, other communities like the IPCC report, the experts of climate change who have said in the report last month that we have 12 short years to basically reverse everything in our global emissions and how we actually save the planet. Uh, so actually I'd love to see this concern way more integrated uh, into the tech and internet community uh, when developing those technical uh, new technologies and these frameworks. And so I'd love to see it as a biggest uh, point, a bigger point for the IGF 2019. Okay, thank you very much. Any specific uh, feedback on this one? Uh, it's about being specific with these technologies and also supporting this purpose of sustainability, right? I, s I, think, I think it goes back to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll just go. I'll be quick. Um, I think it goes back to what was said before uh, by the lovely lady right here. Um, so what are the priorities uh, for twist workiness? In which framework is it that we actually want to work when we talk about the overlapping um, applications of machine learning systems, uh, big data, and IoT? Um, so it's an open question. I don't have an answer, but I, but I do agree with you that um, the environment and the, the, the planet and so should also be one of the many focuses that we should focus on. Thank you. And I go, f I go further. Um, my first job in Washington was working for Senator Gore. My morning was spent preparing hearings on global warming and the coming climate crisis, and my afternoons was spent looking at how IT and the internet will solve that problem. I think our report can do both. We can look at the problems, but also look at the opportunities for massive cost saving, reduced transportation costs, more efficient uh, supply chains with these technologies. That, that, will, that will help us save the planet. Thank you. So I think what we take away, and I'm just looking at uh, the members, but also at you, we take away that next to the principles, we also look at, so what can we achieve with doing it, getting it right? Uh, please, your turn. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Engel. I am with the Youth IGF in Canada. Uh, I also work with the Ontario Digital Service. Um, so something as a person living in Toronto that's come up a lot in the past year and in the last few weeks especially is um, one very significant application of AI big data and um, forgetting the third one all combining is smart cities and um, that's something of significant concern because what we're seeing in that space is not only issues of data governance but sort of the question of how does IoT um, and these technologies transform not only our virtual environment but our physical one. And sort of to the point of um, trustworthiness and security and privacy by design, um, I think we really need to think about inclusivity and diversity by design because I think that those are really subsets of a broader issue in the tech space around inclusivity. Um, so I would really like to see in these best practices a more focus on um, thinking about meaningful consent in the application of these technologies and consultation with communities. Um, I also think I'd like to refer you to sort of some of the work in digital government happening around digital service standards and what that looks like um, in terms of inclusion from the very beginning design stage of technologies to their execution and further iteration. Um, and yeah, lastly, just the point that you know, trustworthiness and being able to trust both your physical and your virtual environments, I think, is a massive privilege for many. So really, yeah, bringing in um, sort of digital inclusion as perhaps an overarching principle um, may be useful for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for both adding in the way a proposal for principle, uh, inclusivity and diversity and for also uh, emphasizing that there's also other areas where we need to also look at the output, not just at the principles. Any reactions to that? Uh, any other points? Please, Wout, and then you. Wout. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Wout Ten um, I've been... Um, Can you turn on your mic, please? My, my mic is on. Oh. Yes, so... My name is Wout Tenatris. Um, I've been a consultant also for the UN uh, the 
couple of years ago on different topics. My point is reach out. As, as I said already in my comment, it's necessary to get other constituencies and stakeholder groups on board. And you most likely are only able to do that when you visit them at, on their own turf. And that is something which the panelists here and others involved may actually be able to do. Because the consultant can't do that, but you have the networks to reach out. And that is something which perhaps the IGF needs to get better in to reach out to, to other stakeholder groups that may actually have the ideas on improvement or on norms or just fill in what you need to have. But reach out is extremely important to become more inclusive. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a good point for the open microphone this afternoon too when uh, experiences with this IGF will be asked. Please. Uh, hello, I'm Nebo Sharego from Bosnia and Herzegovina and a member of MAD. First, thank you very much for, for this very confusing, but in a positive sense, uh, session. Uh, recently, I had a chance to, to listen to Tony Cheng, uh, director of uh, Alibaba, who uh, gave example how for CCTV they did the uh, artificial intelligence uh, software which uh, uh, shortened the period of uh, making summary of a football match. Uh, they needed six persons working half an hour to have a five to ten minutes summary of the football match. Uh, initially they made it and uh, they shortened the period uh, for ten minutes with two persons needed. After a couple of months uh, they needed no persons and it, they, in the ten minutes after the match the summary was prepared. Recently we had the example of uh, again I think Chinese television where artificial intelligence uh, uh, just a person announcer uh, was uh, uh, reading the, the news that somebody else prepared in a sense of this last session what's next is the next step that we will have cameras around monitoring whole world and artificial intelligence making the 10 minute summary and broadcasting it to us thank you since I'm the rapporteur for this session and have to write a summary of it, I really wish we had that technology today. <laughs> that would be it, yes. Well, it, I think the point is wider. It's what is the impact of this towards the future of work as well. Yeah. Um, uh, we haven't discussed that to be within the scope of, of this uh, best practice forum, but uh, there may be faults about that. Just a reference, uh, I've been involved with a group called Internet uh, Innovation for Jobs, the number four. Uh, Vince Cerf founded this group about six years ago, and we've done about 10 international meetings. Um, we've been looking at this issue a lot and, and trying to determine how to generate new jobs as old jobs get replaced. Um, there was a, a panel on this topic, and I, I, I wasn't able to go, but I'm certainly going to watch the, the the videotape of it and I'd urge everyone else to because if we don't get this part right, if everyone fears the future, the tech lash will get larger and larger, there'll be more constraints on how we can use the technologies we're talking about and we will miss a huge opportunity to save the environment, promote growth, promote peace. I mean there's a lot of things that won't happen and we may never know. So let's work on uh, a positive vision for the future. And if I may include everyone while we do so. Okay, so we include this part of uh, the work towards next year? I think uh, the, attitudes. The, the attitudes will take <laughs> forward. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, uh, since then, uh, you know, uh, I'm working on an OECD to develop an uh, developing a principle on AI and for the trust and adoption at the same time. So then I just let me sh introduce some findings, just looking at the proposed best practice and then which to me uh, missing the point, maybe covered by the, the other sentences, but a couple of points, like the first point is if you implement a new technology then, then you know, the, the, the change is so fast, then, then we have to think of the balance between the opportunity and the risks, and particularly for the, if you, as a policymaker or like a stakeholders group, then we have to think of the trade-off between, like for example, accuracy of the AI versus the transparency or like you mentioned in the trustworthiness of the system. It's gonna be the trade-off. And then 
particularly for AI, I would say, it's the use of AI is more like a depends on the context when you use. Like if you want, if you ask the Netflix to recommend a good movie for your mood, it's totally different from the data collection for the cancer detection for the system. So then, so then, like if you think of the cancer detection, then maybe the system wants more data about your very sensitive zone. On the other hand, like Netflix, maybe you can just easily agree to get my data so for the better recommendation. So maybe uh, in, in, I'm not really sure where it should be here, but uh, maybe we have to think of these things in, in, in thinking of the implementation of technology in the next time. Thank you. Are you flexible? Yep. Yes, thank you very much. Any final remarks? Uh, otherwise, I think we can thank you for, for your excellent input, your active listening. And uh, we do take the points forward that have been uh, mentioned in terms of the principles we've heard, uh, in particular diversity uh, added to there. Um, and we've heard uh, the importance of not only looking at the principles, but also, so, so what are we going to achieve with it? So good practice in that should be possible too. Uh, so with that, uh, we will produce, uh, as Mike said, uh, a report within 12 hours after this meeting. <laughs> uh, you'll be invited to introduce, I mean, this uh, paper that you've seen has been prepared by a relatively small uh, group of people, but a very diverse group of people. It's not a closed group of people. If you want to participate, that's possible. And uh, all you need to do is raise your hand. You don't even need to pay your travel cost, although it's handy if you can connect to the internet for that. Um, so do get involved, uh, get your comments back to uh, the report as well. And uh, looking forward to see you next year with a document that may be convincing to a wider group. And with you and us, we can take it out to a wider group to add to a better AI, IoT, BD combination to serve human beings. Thank you very much.